Yeah, good morning. Please sit down. Please introduce yourselves. Good morning. I am Dr. Amina, coming from Regional Cancer Center, Trivandrum. Finally, our process. Uh, good morning. I'm Dr. Gina Mariam George, coming from Regional Cancer Center, uh, Trivandrum. Uh, Finally, a uh, PG student. Right. So, post burn contractures uh, release as a case usually would be a short case, but depending on the number of cases that an institute would have, it could be a short case or it could be a long case. So, you can present your case. Good morning. 54 year old gentleman Rajan Mason by occupation came with following complaints excessive postborn scarring at the lower part of chin neck extending in front of chest upper abdomen bilateral upper arm as a result of burn that occurred at 30 at 10 years of age he is having grossly restricted neck movements with inability to look upward history of presenting illness patient sustained burns from an oil lamp at 10 years of age the burns involved the lower part of chin front of neck chest till upper abdomen and bilateral upper arm approximately 20 percentage of the total body surface area initially he was managed in hdu later in burns unit and discharged after one month gradually he developed scar tissue on those burnt areas history of three surgeries for postborn contracture release under ga last surgery was five years back no history of strider, voice change, hoarseness of voice. No history of respiratory distress, suit in sputum, coughing or wheezing during the time of surgery. No history of airway intervention or tracheostomy in the, in the past. No relevant past history, personal history or treatment history. General examination. Patient is conscious, oriented to time, place and person, comfortably sitting. No signs of respiratory distress. Is thin built and nourished. BMI of 18.4. Veins are accessible and vitals are normal. On airway examination, his mouth opening is more than three finger. Malambati grade three. No loose tooth or missing tooth. Thyromental distance could not be assessed. Sternomental distance is eight centimeter. Upper lip bitus grade three. Is unable to protrude the lower mandible. Uh, thyromandal temporomandibular joint he can we cannot insinuate one finger in front of tagus and neck extension lateral rotation both are limited nostrils were normal on local examination inspection there is burn scar over the lower part of chin extend into upper part of sternum front of neck laterally up to medial border of the right sternocleidomastoid uh, chest till the umbilicus and bilateral upper arm left clavicle is visible one third of the right clavicle is covered by scar tissue there is two contraction brand from mentum to right suprasternal area there is no ulcer or sinus thyroid cricoid uh, and cricothyroid membrane is not palpable on palpation scar is non tender firm and raised above the sternum uh, skin uh, sternal notch is not palpable thyroid cricoid cricothyroid membrane trachea is not palpable all other system within normal limits so 55 year old gentleman with postborn contracture on lower chin, front of neck, chest, upper abdomen and bilateral upper arm with difficult airway of limited neck extension is scheduled for elective contracture release and elective skin grafting under GA. In the history that you took, yeah, please sit down. What's the most important information that you gathered with regards to anesthetizing this patient? Yeah, it's on. Go ahead. Uh, from the history that uh, patient is having only uh, 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 injuries over the chest and uh, upper part of the uh, chest and uh, neck. Okay. Uh, uh, so th the site of no injury was important to you. That's the information. Yes. And, uh, uh, it was uh, at the age of 10 years. So around uh, 46 years back. So the injury occurred, burn injury occurred 46 years mm -hmm. back. Okay. Then uh, the total burn surface area is uh, around 20%. Okay. Uh, then uh, is, is that important now in a chronic burn, the total burn surface area? Uh, or would it be more relevant in an acute burn? Uh, more relevant in an acute burn. So acute not burns. very relevant now. Okay. Then, and why is it important how long back the burns occurred? Uh, it, uh, whether we can uh, use muscle relaxants like uh, succinylcholine or NDMR. Okay. Uh, so, uh, with regards to the use of succinylcholine, it will tell you 
whether it would be safe to use or not to not, say not, not safe, safe to use. use okay right uh, also then there is no history of inhalational injury there were uh, no uh, airway manipulations done in the past like tracheostomy or prolonged ventilation okay so probably the trachea and all will be in position the larynx will be in proper position so and inhalational injury and prior manipulations of the airway requiring okay. prolonged ventilation if there were any what are the implications how would that alert you uh uh there would be uh, uh the larynx may not be in the proper position then the there may be uh, uh, tracheal stenosis or uh, deviation of trachea uh correct okay. so there could be injury to the trachea okay. which could have resulted in tracheal stenosis so, so which could result in problems okay. this time okay any other things in the history Patient has any history of prolonged ventilation, post-op ventilation? History of ventilation. So your patient had history of five surgeries, three, is it? Three surgeries, three surgeries in the past. past, but no mechanical ventilation in the post-operative period. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Now, can we assess the severity of this burns contracture? You know, uh, how would we know that it's really very severe post-burn contracture? It's a mild one. It's a okay one. How do we come to know about that? Based on a classification, on us classification, there is uh, four types of contracture. What classification? Correct. On us classification. Okay. And then uh, it uh, type one is uh, the patient will be able to flex. Keep, keep the mic closer to your mouth. Yeah. Uh, there will be con mild contracture. The patient will be able to flex his neck and chin and can bring it to normal position. So he can do this. Right. Okay. In type two, uh, there will be more moderate contracture. He will be able to flex the neck. And can bring it to normal position, but uh, the on looking upward, there will be withdrawing of the lower lip. And so, when he tries to look up, the contracture pulls the lower lip down. That's the grade two. Okay. In grade three, it is severe. That is, patient will be able to flex neck and chin, and the chin will be um, attached to the lower sternum, and uh, patient uh, he cannot bring it to a normal position. And in uh, type four, there will be posterior contracture. Okay. So extreme. whether it's a uno or modified uno, you have three or four degrees. So depending on which degree of contracture it is, you would know the severity of that. Again, it could be classified into A and B, where again the the band of contracture is less than two centimeters or more than two centimeters. Right. So you get an idea about how severe the contracture would be in this patient. in general when you take a patient with this chronic burns you know you you know that there is a surgery that's going to happen what are the problems that you would anticipate what would come to your mind uh, first would be his difficult airway difficult airway then difficult venous access venous access could be difficult that's the importance you 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 have to know where all the burns had occurred suppose it's just over the head neck face these things and the limbs are not affected then probably you know you can sleep well okay venous access wouldn't be difficult right uh, then monitoring may be difficult in this patient the gel electrodes may not show the ecg we will have to uh, 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 place needle electrodes okay uh, then uh, are, are just the needle electrodes an alternative or do you have any other alternatives if the usual area of placing the electrodes we are can, involved we can keep it little more lower down on the chest and abdomen yeah you could use the posterior surface you can use the alternate lead placement techniques for monitoring the ecg yes, yes. then uh, burns over the uh, upper part of arm it may be difficult to uh, measure the nibp so we can go for invasive or we can place the nibp cuff on the lower limbs so placement and monitoring of non invasive blood pressure could be difficult so much so in some cases you might have to go in for intra arterial blood pressure yes then uh, these patients may uh, this patient had uh, uh, three surgeries in the past and uh, could have been on uh, narcotics then the, the patient will have a high tolerance to narcotic drugs okay anything else related to three surgeries in the past especially when you explain the risk to the patient very often people tend to become casual three surgeries nothing happened so they would expect that nothing should happen in the fourth surgery also so such cases actually scare me you know 
you, you need to all take all the more precautions to explain the risks if there are any and you know make sure that they understand the gravity of the situation otherwise they will think every time every time it went well if something went wrong this time it's probably you who is the cause and not the problem in the patient so you need to be very careful about that yes uh, then this patient may be malnourished uh, due to the okay. prolonged surgeries and right is... right um, and yes. some concerns with the burn surgeries like how much is being operated mm -hmm. upon depending on that blood loss, loss and the intraoperative temperature, temperature loss intraoperative temperature management would be concerned so these are some of the concerns that you would have in your mind when you are taking up a burns patient so neuromuscular monitoring also maybe patient may require neuromuscular monitoring again maybe difficult because of the there are burns over the arms also but difficult to place the electrode and all so what is the significance of uh, when should you uh, what is, a, is it contraindicated burns uh, succinically in this patient no sir in this patient succinylcholine is not uh, uh, contraindicated okay, because okay. it's more than two years since this burns okay, so which is a unsafe period or it should be avoided uh, from 24 hours maximum up to two years up to maybe up to one to two years yeah so well, less than uh, 40 uh, 40 hours you can use and uh, more than uh, two years definitely we can use and what is the worry about using succinyl clean what is the problem of using such uh, in burn patients there is uh, uh, post junctional uh, acetylcholine receptors will be proliferated that will lead to a prolonged depolarization and also increased release of potassium there may be fatal hyperkalemia and cardiac arrest so there is hypersensitivity to uh, hypersensitivity to succinylcholine depolarizing muscle relaxation and what is that what's the problem with the ndmr uh, there is resistance to ndmr uh, due to increased proliferation of acetylcholine receptors the uh, they will need a higher dose of a higher bolus dose and uh, the action will be shortened okay so there's a concern about the usage of uh, either depolarizing muscle relaxation or non depolarizing muscle relaxation okay and which needs monitoring intraoperatively okay yeah, did you mention in your airway assessment as to the which of the nares right or left nostril was more patent? So both nostrils were patent. Did you mention that yes, or I missed yes, it? You yes, have sir. mentioned that. How did you check that? So cold spatula test. Uh, How do you do that? Uh, we'll ask the patient to breathe to the spatula. We can uh, see the condensation. Why should it be cold? Sir. Why should it be cold? Then only the condensation will develop. Only then you will be able, able to see the condensation. Appreciate the condensation. Okay. Any other way by which you can test the patency of the nostril? Any yes. other way by which other than the cold spatula test by which you can check which nostril is more patent? Simple things. Ask the patient himself. He might Close guess which one, nose, nose, which side he will be able to breathe better or keep a cotton wool in front and see which side moves better. Okay. Uh, you can do it in a more sophisticated way also topicalize and visualize the patency of the both the nostril also. Right. The, particularly if there was a history of previous uh, inhalation injury or hospital intubation uh, like uh, previously on ICU with, on ventilation then probably we can uh, definitely go for a detailed examination of upper airway to know the patency of the nostril. In this case, it was not there, I think. You mentioned several parameters in your uh, preoperative airway assessment. Can you tell me the significance of those or what information have you gathered from those? So you started with mouth opening, is it? Yeah, okay. How did, you, how, how did you check the mouth opening? Mouth opening was adequate. The patient in neutral position, the patient was asked to uh, open the mouth and uh, we check the interincisor distance. It is more than three fingers. Then, since the so you check the interincisor gap. Okay. So you said three finger breaths. More than five centimeter or three finger. Okay. Right. So how much should it be? What information does does it give to you? If it is one centimeter, what's your interpretation? If it is three centimeter, if it is five centimeter. So how does your uh, this is adequate mouth opening? We can uh, use a video laryngoscope or even a direct laryngoscope. Approximately and, uh, how much do you require mouth opening to use a direct laryngoscope or a video laryngoscope? Uh, direct laryngoscope, 5 centimeter. Mm -hmm. uh, 
video laryngoscope is uh, 3 cm okay so 4 cm you cannot no, put sir. a <laughs> <laughs> bargainable is it extendable and for supraglottic airway device if it is more than 3 cm 3 uh, fingers 5 cm we can use a supraglottic airway yeah device. when it is more we can definitely use that i know and everybody can tell less than how much it would be difficult to use or not possible to use a supraglottic airway device because i always look at a supraglottic airway device for this case either as a primary airway management equipment or a rescue airway management equipment okay so i have to have an idea whether it will be useful or not useful outright if the mouth opening is less than dash centimeters or a limit then it wouldn't be useful so how much do you think would be required to insert a supraglottic airway device again you have a family of supraglottic airway devices again it might vary in millimeters but in general how much do you think two finger breath yeah approximately four how many four centimeters four centimeters four centimeters might be too much yeah <laughs> again it de depends whether you have deflated the cuff completely or not right so mouth opening inter incisor gap what's the next parameter that you studied you 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 mentioned sternometal distance okay what's the significance uh, of that it was how much 9 cm in your 8 cm uh, is it normal or abnormal this is less no less than normal normal okay. is uh, 12 cm okay. patient won't be able to extend his neck Okay. Uh, so we cannot obtain the sniffing the morning air position while okay. doing scopy. Okay. Um, then we could not assess the. So what's the normal sternomental distance? Thirteen centimeter. Twelve point five to thirteen. Twelve point five to thirteen. Thirteen centimeter. So does it just tell you that extension is restricted or not? Then we can directly check for the extension, right? What exactly are we checking uh, with sternomental distance? Atlanta occipital. Atlanta occipital extension. are we checking, checking the extension with the sternomental distance uh the adequacy of the mandibular space one of the things yes yes you, when the extension is restricted your distance would be less when the mandibular space is less also the distance would be less okay but extension you can always check with the other parameters also you directly ask the patient to flex and extend you need not always have to measure the sternomental distance to determine whether extension flexion is normal or abnormal okay what's the other parameter that you checked thyromental distance okay in this patient we could it's not it's also assess. called as called by what name thyromental uh, distance savas any uh, louder yeah savas any any indian's name we are we are always Patils, proud we should Patils be distance. proud right yeah patil's distance okay uh, in this patient we could not assess the thyromental distance because of the contracture okay um, though you didn't assess the thyromental distance do you assess anything here in this area submandibular space yeah what what exactly do you assess in the submandibular space um thyo mental distance okay the distances yes. other than the distance are you the, feeling anything there do you feel the consistency of the tissues there yes no do you want to see whether it is hard or is it compliant soft there in this area submandibular space area what you said Uh, in this patient, there were uh, bands, uh, and the uh, uh, scar tissue was very much so formed. So it's hard. Scar tissue is there. It's very stiff. So what does that mean? Why do we need the anterior mandibular or submandibular space during airway management? Uh, uh, for the uh, adequate scopy and to displace the tongue. Yeah. Why? Why do we need that space during scopy? To displace the tongue. Very good. So to displace the tongue. So if that is hard and non-compliant, then probably we will not be able to displace the tongue during our laryngoscopy. So thyromental distance, you said you couldn't measure in this patient. Okay. What else did you assess in the preoperative airway examination? The patient was not able to protrude his mandible. Okay. Uh, upper lip by test was uh, grade three. Okay. Then uh, malampati score was three. Okay. D can you really call this as Malampati uh, class, no, whatever. What's what are the prerequisites to uh, actually evaluate the Malampati score? This patient can bring the uh, face to the neutral position, so, so he could, could keep the head in head the, neutral in the neutral position. position. Okay. 
and uh, how is that well, it is the tongue, sh- tongue should be protruded or tongue should be tongue should be protruded okay and uh, uh, we are looking at the patient the level of the mouth okay you are at the, the level, level of the mouth. mouth and should he phonate or should he not phonate should not phonate should not okay. phonate okay so this was what was the class here class 3 class 3, three. Modif- modified malampati okay. okay who modified malampati classification Sam, Soon, <laughs> Soon and Yang, yeah. Okay. Sam, Soon and Yang, yeah. Right. So, what other airway parameters did you check? Yes. That's it. Neck extension. Neck movements. Extension. Okay. So, what were the findings in uh, your patient? His neck extension is limited, and lateral rotation of the neck is also limited. Lateral rotation is limited, and neck extension is also limited. Okay. Why do we need movements at the head and neck during airway management to maintain the normal alignment of the axis that is oropharynx uh, laryngopharynx and the trachea we need to make all the three axes in a more horizontal position okay oral pharyngeal and laryngeal yeah, axis to bring them in straight line you need what movements uh, extension sir, at atlanta occipital atlanta occipital and joint and, and cervical flexion flexion at the cervical okay. spine okay and what do we call this uh, position as sniffing oh. the morning air position sniffing the morning air position or megill's position okay so in your patient what was the range of movement can we measure this is there an instrument i am sure nobody uses that but still in exams you could be asked what's the instrument to measure the neck movements objectively we can use one scale sir. yeah scale uh, attract yeah the techniques are there keeping the fingers and the instrument goniometer have you heard of that yeah okay okay right so yeah with anything else you assist in the airway manage airway assessment he was having two contracture brands towards the right supra uh, right clavicle okay um, and there was a scar tissue predominantly over the right side sir. okay right so what's your plan for airway management in this patient so for, for this patient i will plan awake fiber optic nasal intubation sir awake fiber optic nasal, nasal intubation. intubation okay but he has had uh, three successful surgeries in the past nicely released why can't we go ahead with the usual routine so the intubation details uh, are not were not available so you, the told, int- you told that two three releases has already three, been three done three releases probably. have already releases. been done but still the patient is having significant contracture and there are no details of previous intubation or surgery anesthesia details available so that's one of the most important thing the details of the past anesthetics okay are very important what were the techniques that were used in the previous anesthetic what difficulties they encountered how was the previous airway management done so according to you it's not available okay so that cautions you again and since it's been some time since the previous surgery has elapsed there could still be scarring which has increased and it could still be a difficult airway right so you have made your plan right so what are your pre operative uh, advice to the patient pre operative pre operative on the day of uh, pre we have got the routine investigations done any special investigation you need uh, x ray neck lateral x ray neck lateral what information do you get from that whether any uh, tracheal stenosis sorry tracheal, tracheal stenosis. stenosis okay anything else other than that displacement you should, lateral dis- displacements or compression interlateral anterior posterior or lateral compressions lateral. okay and other than that routine investigations okay especially uh, serum potassium okay right H- hemoglobin right so how will you prepare this patient for a weak fiber optic nasotracheal intubation so on the pre-op day i will uh, counsel the patient about the procedure explain the procedure to him and uh, routine uh, 
fasting guidelines will be advised and routine uh, and anti aspiration prophylaxis anti anxiolytics everything will like tap and aprosol 40 mg tadalprosol 0.5 mg then on the day of surgery i will confirm the npo status i will uh, take the high risk consent and i uh, will check the that day's baseline electrolyte values and uh, i will uh, confirm iv access by uh, patent iv access then i will uh, before taking the patient to ot you will kind of calculate the total cal total amount total dose of maximum dose of local anesthetic uh, so on the uh, pre op area itself uh, i will uh, give 4% nebulization to ml so you said you will calculate the maximum dose of local anesthetic that you could use for this patient for topicalization so how did you calculate this for your patient sir in our institution we take a uh, what is the weight of this patient 50 kg sir in so our, how much will you do maximum dose for or the same uh, dose maximum dose uh, in our institution we take 4 mg per kg if it is plain lignocaine but uh, in these patients we can give up to maximum 9 mg per kg plain plain sir a plain, plain lignocaine Oh, do you pro go for the safe dose? Why so you are going for nine milligram per kg? That is the uh, safest dose with adrenal. No, with plain lignocaine, I think better you go to three Maybe to five milligram. Four mg three per to kg. five milligram per kg body weight. So there will be a maximum of two hundred milligram. Two hundred fifty kg. So since it's a topicalization, we actually don't know how much get absorbed and how much is spit out by the patient and comes out during nebulization. So there are people who say that you can take a higher dose range, even up to ten milligrams per kg, as the safe limit dose. But you need to monitor the patient and be cautious so you said you would not nebulize with 4% lignocaine lignocaine 2 yeah. ml uh, then the patient then atomization with uh, 2 ml for percentage lignocaine okay then after taking patient to the ot we'll attach all the monitors will start one iv fluid then we'll pre i'll pre oxygenate the patient uh, then i will stand in front of patient uh, with all the monitors in front of me the pre induction monitors where are going to attach uh, nibp ecg heart uh, spo2 it so, so you are just happy with 4% nebulization uh, lignocaine nebulization with 4% 4 and uh, atomization so that's it 10% uh, spray to the posterior pharyngeal wall uh, uh, the tonsillar pillars ulla posterior part of tongue okay. that then uh, we'll give silometasol in nasal drops and uh, iv glycopyrrolate 0.2 mg okay do you want to sedate Just, this patient or not sedate before the procedure uh, sedation we'll give a uh, fentanyl 1 uh, microgram per kg and if a senior anesthetist is present we'll give midazolam 0.5 to 1 mg per kg you'll have to be very cautious it's better to give titrated doses rather than telling the fixed doses especially when difficult airway is anticipated okay right so let's see some of the problems it's not a good day for you you are doing a fiber optic intubation you are trying everything is foggy everything is you know it's like a fog that's coming whatever is in your view what will you do we'll take out the scope and we'll clean it and reinsert you reinsert it again it is fogging give suction you do it three so times four times you do suction also it's still fogging so then meanwhile we'll be keep continuing the oxygenation to the patient yeah how do you do how do you continue the oxygenation from where you are giving the oxygen nasal, nasal prongs we can give high flow and exhale oxygen no for the problem of fogging to solve that will oxygen supplementation help you can help? give demister can be demister solution demister solution yeah you'll have to buy that and then yeah the company will be happy any simple <laughs> solution oxygen through any other port that you can give which will blow through away the fo fogging thing through the suction port we can you give can oxygen. administer yes, oxygen. oxygen so that could solve the problem with regards to fogging that can happen okay as you are pro progressing the fiber optic scope suddenly you see pink thing it's all pinked out on the screen what do you do i will pull out the scope we'll give suction okay you pull out the scope to a place where you can identify the anatomy and then you proceed okay not just blindly push okay right now suddenly it's it's becoming red i said it's a bad day for you everything is happening which shouldn't be happening yeah uh, again we'll take out the uh, we'll give suction we'll try giving suction okay. and again we'll take out the scope and uh, okay. we'll reload again 
okay so you can take out clean the tape mm. and then reinsert you can do suctioning Suction. you can touch against the mucosa there just to clear the tip of the whatever blood drop or blood clot is there okay what problems can you encounter when you are pushing the tube in into the trachea you have visualized the uh, glottis you have passed your scope through now you are railroading the endotracheal tube what problems could you encounter it can impinge on the epiglottis on the and the post anterior commissure okay um, then before it can, that before that even before reaching the epiglottis any, any problem can come the patient can uh, become restless so you have prepared well the patient is uh, quiet so when you pass the tracheal tube down at what level we can have some difficulty the level of the inferior turbinate itself we can have difficulty yeah, because passing of through the turbinate the and then the posterior coil coil area okay. that time also some difficulty can come okay then if so it is a large epiglottis we can have difficulty in passing then we can change the position of the patient to lateral or we can ask the patient to phonate how exactly do you know or we can just the uh, where exactly is the tube hinging whether it is at the level of the epiglottis or is it on the right side of the glottis left side of the glottis how do you come to know that because it's all blind right railroading the tube is blind you are not seeing anything how do you know that so on the up, on the central part it will be hinging sir so you basically look where exactly on the front of the neck it is hinging so this could be tricky not easily possible when there is a post burn contracture is there any maneuver by which you can uh, suppose it's hinging on the right side of the glottis how can you negotiate it into the trachea so we can rotate the tube directly rotate or before rotation do you have to do anything we have to pull out and pull out pull the, the tube disengage that and rotate to which side anti clockwise 90 degrees anti clockwise direction by how much 90 degrees yeah so it's always you rotate more because the rotation at the tip will be less than what you would be performing outside is there any endotracheal tube which can increase the success rate of negotiating through the glottic opening parabic tube okay what's the advantage of the tube it's tip is that curved. tube or say your flexometallic tube or silicon wire reinforced tube what advantages do they have over the routine pvc tube its tip will be curved so it will not be impinging on the epiglottis or the anterior commission of the vocal cords the tip is different compared to the pvc tube which would increase the success rate right are we uh, do we have time no no yeah okay. yeah right so we have intubated we did have some problems there is a whole list of problems that could occur we could discuss the alternate techniques of anesthetic management use of supraglottic airway devices use of general anesthesia patient breathing spontaneously without muscle relaxant with muscle relaxant a situation where you land in trouble where you will have to use the rescue airway okay having the presence of surgeon in the operating room when you are doing all this tracheostomy consent in the preoperative period okay so lot more things can be discussed we did discuss some of the things which are relevant okay thank you well presented thank, thank you very